Welcome to Labor's View. This show is brought to you by the very hardworking, dedicated employees of the Essex County Division of Welfare. And they are, as well, the members of the Communications Workers of America a Union, Local 1081. I'm David Weiner, president of that union and host of Labor's View. This evening, we're going to talk about something that may or may not relate to many people, as some of our other shows don't may or may not relate or may not have related. But tonight we're going to talk about staffing in the Essex County Division of Welfare, which we've done before, but not within this particular context. And I know right off the bat, some of our viewers are going to say, who cares about staffing of Division of Welfare? People shouldn't be receiving welfare in the first place. They're lazy bums. They should be get off their bus. They should go to work. Many Republicans are saying that nationwide right now as they, as they get ready for the, uh, the November uh, House elections and, and they get ready for the uh, 2016 presidential election. But I'll show you how it's not only important to the people whom we serve, which are the poorest and the neediest of the County of Essex, but also how it's important to those, to those of you who are employed, don't get public assistance, and might or might not resent the fact that others do and that our members serve them. Now let's start off with this fact, okay? And this was uh, reported in the Star-Ledger on March 26, 2014, which is only a few months ago because we're taping this on September 19th, Jerry? 20th. 20th. I'm a day off. The 20th. This says, basically, Essex County ranks 20 out of 21 New Jersey counties for social economic factors, and number 20 for morbidity. That means death. So that means that Essex is like nearly the worst county in all of the counties in the state of New Jersey when it comes to sociological numbers, integers. We're talking about not just welfare, number of welfare recipients, who is where the largest in the state, probably the 10th or 12th largest welfare entity in the nation, bigger than most states. And we're not bragging, we're just saying that's, the, that's a fact, and it's a number of causative factors because of that, that cause it. But the fact is that Essex is really a county of, that's a tale of two counties, if you will, to paraphrase a, an English author. And that is, you have the east part of the county, the bottom, if you will, of the county, Newark, East Orange, Irvington, Orange, uh, that, uh, and parts of other counties as well, Bloomfield, Belleville, Nutley, and then you can go up West, South Orange, West Orange. We're everywhere, believe me. Um, people may not think so. We're even in Short Hills, uh, but it's a very rich town for those who don't know it. But the fact is that the the population of the Division of Welfare has exploded. This is the premise of this show. And that the staffing levels have not changed. In fact, they've not even reached a minimum level required by a legal understanding between the state and the county since the year 2000, which I've discussed before, but now it's coming in a different context. So we did a presentation uh, back on 12-13, that was December uh, 2013. And this was a presentation to a what they call Welfare Reform Committee. And we made note of the fact that back in the year 1999 and the years 1999-2000, former county executive Jim James Treffinger, who ironically I went to college with, um, but we didn't interact because I was doing things differently. He was studying. And uh, James, Jim, uh, came up with some outlandish stuff because he was running for Senate and he was being like a, like Christie is now running for president. All these right wing horrible decisions against the disabled, against women, against health, and all these th type of things. So Jim decided that rather than increase taxes, he was going to, amongst other things, he was going to get then Governor Christy Whitman, to an, another Republican, both Republicans, to loan the, the county, or allow the county, strike that, to allow the county 
to take $15 million that was intended for staffing for the Division of Welfare and just put it in his treasury. And this way he could balance his budget and say, I, never, I didn't raise taxes, or I didn't raise taxes that much. Well, we challenged it. And there's an article in, in the, because it was 8.5 million, I think, in 1999, and then 6.5 in the year 2000. So our union, I, challenged it, and it was in the Star Ledger. And I said, you're robbing from the poor to give to the rich and the middle class. You're a reverse Robin Hood. And Jim said, oh, no, no way. It's only because we need it so badly. We're going to return the money. And ironically, the freeholder board president at the time is now the county executive for the last eight or 12 years. Uh, I forget which it is now. He's running for re-election now. And that was Joe DiVincenzo. He was the, I believe, newly elected freeholder board president. And he's even quoted in the article saying, yeah, this, this really concerns me. Well, let's see how much it concerned him. So unbeknownst to us for a number of years, us the union, the county and the state to cover up that $15 million, which is literally just taken from us and put into the treasury, which I think is a number of violations on a number of levels, both federal and state. But what they did was the county and state, I believe in the year 1999, started entering into memorandums of understandings. They did it each year. And each year, that memor they signed them each year for the last 13, 14 years now. They signed them and they said, we're going to give you that $15 million, but it's a loan. And you've got to pay it back by the middle of the year. And they did every, so we really lost the money. All they're doing is loaning us money that, they, that the county administration stole from us and put into the treasury. So. I did what's known as an Open Public Records Act request. I did it to the county, and I did one version to the state for the same documents. And sure enough, what happened was that the county only gave us two years worth of, out of then 12 or 13 years of memory, their MOUs, let's go with MOU, 12 or 13 years of MOUs. And the state gave us Oh, uh, I think about four or five years. So we did a government records council complaint to the state, and we said, uh, we're appealing it. The, the county's got to have more documents. The state has them. And they're supposed to be the exact same document. So then the county came up with uh, four, 2004, 2006, 2009, and 2000. So they added to the 11 and 12 that they'd given us. OK. So what happens? Here's the Memorandum of Understanding from the year 2000. And this is the actual copy of the actual document. And it's for 2000 for fiscal relief in 2000, actually. It was, it was provided in 1999. This is the first one. And it says that they're going to increase the county um, to $15 million. That's the $15 million I talked about. And they're going to loan it to them. And here's the letter to our then fiscal guy. And the letter, the, mem the memorandum itself says that at the time, we had about 790-something employees. We were short 50 or 60. The point is, we were supposed to have 821 or so minimum number of total employees in the Division of Welfare. And each year, each year from 1999 through the year, 2013 going into 14, all the MOUs, the last one was 13. There'll be a new one in December. They said you have to have a minimum number of staff. Well, what happened was we did an MOU to the county, remember, and I'm sorry, we did an OPA request, the Open Public Records Act, and we said, okay, give us the staffing levels, documents. You can't ask for information. You've got to give documents. All documents that, that delineated, noted on, on paper, how many staffing, that, how much, what staffing levels did we have between the years 1999 and 2012? Because I did this request in 2013. And as it turns out, in all those years where we were supposed to have a minimum of approximately 821 total staff, we only reached or attained that staffing level once in the year 2010. And that was it. So all those other years, the county has been in violation of a memorandum of understanding with the state of New Jersey because they're getting money under false pretenses, except for that one year. They're getting money saying that one of the things you have to do 
is have a minimum staffing level. Well, that's, this is where that becomes important. And by the way, this is the 14 one, but I'll get back to that one. This is the, the most recent, it's 2013 for relief in 2014. So all of a sudden, two things happened since then. In 2008, you had the market crash. And that was primarily because of Wall Street. And Wall Street uh, putting out, what they did is they bundled, simply put, they bundled a bunch of, they gave a lot of mortgages to a lot of people, including people who should not have had them. They also allowed people who had money to borrow big on their houses, which were worth a lot of money at that time. And they spent it on various things, some frivolous, some important, some college, some boats, whatever, tra travel figuring that the, market, the housing market would keep on going up and they could pay it back, no problem. Well, what happened was they also, Wall Street, they packaged these, these um, mortgages to people that really shouldn't have had mortgages, that they just convinced to get them because their finances were wobbly. They, their jobs weren't really secure or whatever the case may be. And so they gave them these questionable mortgages and then they bundled them together and they, they, they sold them, the, the finance, the, the Wall Street, they sold these things to pension systems like the state of New Jersey employees, pension systems in the private sector, pension systems everywhere. And what happened, lo and behold, in 2008, the bottom fell out, and it was found out that a lot of these were called toxic. These were toxic instruments that they were selling to these pension systems, so meaning that a lot of the people, because the economy fell out, they defaulted. In fact, New Jersey still has one of the highest default rates on housing in the entire country. People are still abandoning their homes because they can't afford them, so they just walk away. So you had that situation, and then the economy tanked. You had GM and all the car companies had to be bailed out. The big banks had to be bailed out, except Lehman Brothers. And for some reason, they didn't bail them out. They let them go down. So. That caused a great deal of instability, not just in the United States, but across the entire world, everywhere, Europe, everywhere. Okay, the second thing that happens comes around and is a positive thing. In our estimation, a lot of people, especially Republicans, have been saying, oh, it's the, the worst thing in the world, it's going to destroy the, the country, and that is the ACA, commonly known as Obamacare, where uh, a couple of things happen. One, they set up exchanges that the federal government did for people who couldn't get Medicaid because their incomes were too high, but they could qualify for Obamacare, which is much more reasonable than what the private market had been because the, 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 the pattern has been over the last 30 years that private employers in particular have gotten out of providing health benefits and pensions to their employees. Some don't provide it at all. And those that do make you pay a very, very high premium for them, for, for those health benefits, or they make you buy your own. So Obamacare comes out, and good things are, happened to me with, with, with my son and daughter, uh, when the, between whatever ages, I don't know, if it's 18 to 26, they can be on your plan. And uh, your, whatever health benefit plan you had, so that, so that was really good. Uh, and then afterwards, they can go on Obamacare at much more reasonable rates. But it also, what it did was, for Medicaid recipients, the, to be a Medicaid recipient, you had to make um, no more than 133% of what the federal poverty level was set at the time, which is a relatively low amount, but not as low as you might think. And then with Obamacare, it raised it to 138% of poverty. So many more people, people with a family of four that could be earning 60 something thousand dollars or maybe even 70 a year could qualify for Obamacare. So it's turned out to be a very good thing despite what the Republicans are saying. In fact, the president predicted, I think it was last year or earlier this year, he predicted that it's gonna be so successful in succeeding years that the Republicans will no longer call it Obamacare because they won't want to give them the credit for it. Okay, so you have all these, these impacts. So what happens with the division of welfare that doesn't have enough staffing, that has the same staffing we had in, in 2000, the year 2000, or even fewer 
than that because they never reached the maximum of the MOUs, Memorandum of Understandings. Well, what happened was that uh, all of a sudden, because of the crash in 2008 and people losing their jobs, uh, people unable to get jobs, uh, people working in Burger Kings and McDonald's getting minimum wage, and which they can't live on. You had that sad story recently of this young woman who, with, with children who was working four minimum wage jobs. And she would run from job to job to job and she would sneak in a nap in her car. But unfortunately, she also carried gasoline in the car just in case she ran out. And she pulled over to, I think, a Wendy's or something like that, took a snooze, left the car running. Between that and the gas, she died. So she died because she couldn't get a decent job. So you have all these people who can't get jobs. And, and, and what's happening is they go, Republicans go, oh, these fast food jobs, they're for teenagers. No, they're not. They're for adults now, more so than teenagers. They're adults. And people, they're vying for those jobs. And the jobs above that used to be only for high school people, now college people are vying for them. Then you have old geezers as I, who are still around, I'll be 64 in December. I know I don't look like it, but I'll be 64 in December. And that's a line I use. And what's happening is a lot of people my age are not retiring because their pensions were decimated because of the crash. Their 401ks, which were invested in those, those toxic instruments to a great extent, they don't have them anymore. They may not have a pension from their job. So security doesn't pay enough. For the price of living in New Jersey is the, one of the highest, if not the highest, in the entire country. So what happens is they're, staying, they're, still, on, they're still at work. So there's huge competition for these jobs, and jobs which are being lowered and lowered because when you have, what, huge supply, the price goes, what, up. Okay, and if you, if you don't have the, the supply and demand, the price will come down. That's the way it works. So, the, the food stamp and the Medicaid are what we're focusing on in terms of the division, not just our welfare, all throughout the, the state. I know because I meet with my counterparts in different welfare agencies. They have gone up respectively, approximately, the caseload has gone up between 50 to 70 percent. I'll repeat. 50 to 70 percent, while the staffing levels have remained what they were or fewer than in the year 1999-2000, which is some 14 to 15 years ago. Well, what's going to happen? What happens is you have hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of clients, recipients coming into the offices, and we can't get to them. We can't see them. We don't have enough people. So we have, most of our offices are in 18 Rector Street, 10 Park Place in Newark. If anybody knows Newark, you've got the YMCA, which I'm on the board, uh, and across the street is our building. At 10 Park Place is the front with the big columns. It used to be the fireman's building. We have all nine floors now. I mean, we, the Division of Welfare. And so then we also have a little office in, at the Hall of Records for child support, and we have an uh, office in, in East Orange, which is a county-owned building, a dump. Uh, where there's some food stamp, client, uh, food stamp workers and clients. So it's almost like it is the perfect storm of all these things coming together. And I'll describe something else that's coming together. So what happens is these waiting rooms that they have, reception areas, and then you go, you have a glass partition, plexiglass booth, and they speak to the reception clerk, clerks through those booths, and then the worker will come and escort you in and interview you. Well, People are waiting there for hours and hours and hours on end. I was at the Medicaid office about a week ago, um, and no, oh, no, I'm sorry, it was this past Tuesday, and it's not unusual. It was so packed. The, the waiting room was totally full. There's a area when you leave the waiting room, you go to where the elevators are. So there's a hallway and elevators, three or four elevators. That was totally packed. And the women who have infants can't bring their strollers into the waiting room because that takes up too much room. So they have to leave them next to the elevator. So it looks like a parking lot of strollers. And people are sitting on the ground, on the floor, 
So much so that when our members come off the elevator in the morning to try to get to their job, they have to wade through clients. And I saw personally, I stood there for two hours in the reception area with our members, our clerks, watching them service these, these clients. And some are old, some are in wheelchairs, some are disabled, but particularly sad when you see women with infants, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, sitting there from 9 in the morning, 8.30 in the morning, until sometimes 2 in the afternoon, and they may not even be seen. Just picture that kind of, of suffering. And what we do now is we, we, I see the agency, they offload the extras after a while, and still too crowded out, even though they do this. They'll put 50 or 60 down on other floors that are not as utilized, such as the sixth floor and the fourth floor. But still you have all these people waiting. And my biggest fear is that we're going to have so many people that it's going to turn out to be as it has in the past few years, where you're going to have people online outside the building in the fall, in the dead of winter, waiting for hours to get into the building, which has occurred not only at the Newark site, but has occurred at the food stamp site, which I believe we've thrown up there on, on, the, on the show in the past. So you've got Medicaid. Now what happened with Medicaid? Well, in 2012, they found out that not only do you have, because you have all these clients, partly, they do what they call a redetermination on all cases. TANF, which is the old aid to families with dependent children, food stamps, Medicaid. That means at least once a year, you have client has to come in, or now they send them a letter, they can fill it out, but generally they come in. And they, they, you have to fill out what the circumstances are. Did they add a child, lose a child? Did the spouse, are they still with their, with their spouse? Whatever. You got to check the circumstances, fill out a form. Well, we had, in two, the end of 2012, it was discovered we had over 90,000 overdue redeterminations. 90,000. So what they did was, the county, they put that overtime from a budget, <clears throat> from a budget which they usually canceled appropriations at the end of the year. I've discussed that before. They budget for 821. Eight, uh, they never hire 821. Come December, they cancel the money they didn't spend. The county saves 40%, 60% they don't get from the feds. That's been an ongoing. Last year, no savings because of the overtime. This year, so we, we got maybe all but 40%, 40, 40,000 of them cleaned up. There's still 40,000. Now that has ancillary issues, like who got Medicaid that wasn't deserving of it? Who got Medicaid or didn't get changes to get more Medicaid because their redetermination wasn't done? Okay, that's ongoing. We just found out a couple of weeks ago that we also have the intake unit. The intake unit is where everything starts. Client goes in to apply there. That's on the first and second floor of that building. Um, 10 Park Place, 18 Rec Street. 18 Rec Street is the side entrance where the clients go in. I call it the servants' quarters. And it was discovered that the intake unit had 10,000 overdue applications for assistance. 10,000. 10,000 people who either didn't get assistance at all or didn't get it in a timely fashion. The reason I say that is that the 4,500 of those are what they call SNAP cases. That's what they call food stamps now. That's the SNAP program. I guess so, to, to, I don't know why they did that, to, to, to try to get away with the stigma of, uh, from the stigma of, of calling it food stamps, whatever. So now it's the SNAP program. So 4,500 of them are SNAP. The rest are TANF, which are women and children welfare, and the rest are Medicaid. More Medicaid backup, okay? So what they do? They put workers on overtime trying to clean this up. But this is what is really, really, really sad. The only cases out of those 10,000 cases, the 4,500 SNAP food stamp cases, those are the ones that the overtime people working, our members working overtime, they were directed to do them and ignore the TANF and the Medicaid. Why? Because the U.S. Department of Agriculture oversees the food stamp program. And, and that only, that's what they oversee. And they've been saying to the state of New Jersey, to the Department of Human Services in the state of New Jersey, all your county welfare agencies combined must reach a 90% level 
of getting the food stamp SNAP cases completed in a timely fashion, which we've not been. When I say we, mean statewide. It was down at like 72%. Why? Because Essex County is the largest welfare agency, as I said, in the state, and we are the most understaffed and overwhelmed. So if our numbers go down, we drag the rest of the state down. So what did the state do? The state went and got federal money somehow to pay for overtime for people to do those 4,500 SNAP cases, but forget about the other 5,500 TANF and Medicaid. They're left alone. So we think, we, our management, I don't know because they don't tell me anything, but our, I find out to my people, but our management believes we're going to reach the, 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 uh, the level by the end of the month because the SNAP, uh, the federal overtime funding runs out, I believe, on uh, September uh, 30, 31st? 30 days have September, maybe 30th, right? 30, uh, 30th. Um, but what happens to the Medicaid and the food stamp clients? And not only that, let's hold them for a, side, for a second. Not only that, but the people, the Medicaid clients, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, the SNAP clients, who they do get done, what they're finding is that many of them, that's why we're able to get through them as quickly as we have been, many of them had applied once or twice and maybe a third time, and whatever was the charm, whatever they applied was the charm, and they got the benefits, they, nobody took into account the time they applied. Let's say they applied in June of last year, and they didn't get, they applied again, and finally they got them in August. No one's going back and giving them the differential, but they're owned those three months. So you have people that did without and are still doing without, plus, Food stamps were reduced, thanks to this governor, Governor Christie. They were reduced, if you recall, this past year and the year or end or the year before. So you, not only do you get them late, but you're getting fewer of them. Now, what do we do? We file grievances. We do all kinds of, of stuff. Uh, here's a grievance from March 13, 2014. Dearth of medi I'd like to use big words. Dearth of Medicaid employees and physical plant capacity. I'm basically saying you don't have enough people in Medicaid. This is back in March of this year. You don't have enough people. And um, you don't have enough people. So not only that, but you don't have enough space. And they can't expand the building. The building was built in 29, 1929. So they're not going to expand the building. That was just new. Well, let's look at child support. I only have a few more minutes. But in child support... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, an intake, which is also child support. I wrote a grievance back in 2012. Here it is here. December 31st, 2012, I wrote a grievance saying, overdue, unprocessed intake applications. And they supposedly cleaned them up. And then, you fast forward, here's a grievance I wrote just last month, August 28th. It's overbooking of, of uh, intake client appointments. What they did was they took too many appointments. It's like maybe what doctors do, airplane, airlines do. And you overbook figure and some aren't going to show. And, but no, we overbooked and virtually everyone showed. So things have not changed. And what does this mean? This means that this administration of Joe D, who I like personally, I've said it many times, where does all the money go? I printed something off the, um, off the county's website. And it shows what the type of things that they're worried about now. This is what they're putting out to bid. Um, Castle, Kipps Castle, which is a, a building they bought from these lawyers. Money for re improvements restoration. Engineering services for the replacement of Brookdale Park. Engineering services for the replacement of Week Week Park. Engineering services for a new playground on Branch Brook Park. Uh, it goes on and on. The park, the zoos, the golf courses. But what about human beings? And for those of you who are, are perhaps against social services, you're paying for it. You're paying for it in money, and you're paying for it in the sociological ills that result. So with that uplifting message, I'm David Weiner, president of Local 1081 CDB Way, host of Labor's View. We hope you found this interesting. We hope to see you for future shows.